ஹலோ மேம் யா டெல் மீ ஆ வில் லைவ் எஸ் வி ஆர் லைவ் நவ் ஓகே so i share my screen that text you should be fine can you tell again please no youtube is fine it's okay um, okay uh, ma'am do you hear some echo from my side right no looks okay now okay uh okay i'll i'll once uh, remove the your
Uh, Ma'am, we'll be starting in a few seconds. I think Rupata is having some uh, technical problem. Okay, no problem. Apologize for the delay, everyone. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we are sorry for the delay. Uh, so, welcome to the 23rd lecture of the Progress and Prospects in Biology webinar series. Uh, so, today we have with us uh, Dr. Chandrama Das of the Shaha Institute of Nuclear Physics. Uh, before we start, there uh, are uh, as you know, that we have a few rules that you just have to put your questions in the YouTube chat box and we shall moderate them at the end of the session. Um, Rupkatha, do you want to take over? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Can everybody hear me, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's yes. coming. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sorry for the technical problems. And uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, so uh, today we are delighted to have with us Dr. Uh, Chandra Dash. She is a structural biologist, and uh, she's an associate professor and a Shornoj Jayanti fellow at the Department uh, of uh, the Biophysics and the Structural Genomics Division, Shaha Institute of Nuclear Physics. She did her BSc in chemistry and uh, MSc in biochemistry from the University of Calcutta. She went on to do her PhD under the mentorship of Professor Kapoor Shekumbu from uh, the Transcription and Disease Laboratory, Molecular Biology and Genetics Unit of the Jawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research 
in Bangalore. Her postdoctoral uh, work was uh, at um, MD Anderson Cancer Center at Houston, Texas, and University of Colorado, Denver, both in the USA. Since 2012, she has been working at the Biophysics and the Structural Genomics Division at Mishan Central Physics, Kolkata. Her field of specialization and expertise was uh, work on the epigenetic regulation of chromatin by reader or effector class of proteins and their implication in human diseases. Now, uh, we know that the mammalian genome is organized into nucleoproteins called the and small modifications in both the DNA as well as the protein component of the chromatin underlies, uh, uh, fine tunes the underlying gene expression, genome repair, replication, and these are known as epigenetic modifications. Now, Dr. Dash's laboratory uh, tries to understand how uh, some of the epigenetic readers, they work in the context of cellular functions and their possible connections to disease, which includes both metabolic as well as infectious diseases. Dr. Chondrima Dash is a recipient of a number of awards and fellowships the S. Ramachandran National Bioscience Award for Career Development. In 2019, she received it from the Department of Biotechnology. Uh, she is a recipient of the Shwamu Jayanti Fellowship, which is given by the Department of Science and Technology in 2018. She received the Ramalika Swami Fellowship from the Department of Biotechnology in 2012. And uh, previously, she had also received the postdoctoral fellowship ordered for research in 2009. Dr. Dash is a member of a number of national and international academies, the American Chemical Society. Uh, she's an elected member of the West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology. She's also an elected member of the Guha Research Conference. Dr. Dash is a life member of uh, Indian Society of Cell Biology, a life member of the Indian Association of Cancer Research, the Chemical Biology Society, and the Society of Biological Chemists. She is also a member of the American Society for Biochemistry Biology. It's, uh, we're really happy to have with us, uh, with her, um, her uh, here with us today. And uh, looking forward to your talk, ma'am. Um, over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Rupkotha, for the nice introduction. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. OK. So good evening, everyone. So today I'm going to talk about a class of protein called chromatin readers effectors, which fine tune the cellular gene expression programs. And for today's talk, I'll be highlighting on its role in regulating the cancer epigenome. So you all know the eukaryotic genome is packaged in the tiny confines of the nucleus. And uh, the genes are actually transcribed from this packaged chromatin. And there are regions in the chromatin which are tightly packaged, which are known as heterochromatin region, whereas there are other regions in the chromatin which are loosely packed. And the gene expression programs are much higher from those regions known as the euchromatin regions. So basically, the euchromatin, heterochromatin regions are important in gene expression regulations. And this is the nucleosomal structure where you find that the core histone octomer is wrapped around by the DNA. And the histone tails get extensively post-translationally modified. As Rupkotha was mentioning, there are small chemical moieties like acetyl group, methyl group, phosphor groups, which are added on to the different amino acid residues onto the histone tails. Not only these small modifications, even big proteins like ubiquitin group can add on to important residues onto the histone tails. So it has to be borne in mind that, as you can see, the histone tails with a lot of different post-translational modifications Combinatorially, this particular epigenetic landscape is very important for deciphering a particular cellular outcome. So 
drawing parallelism with genetic code, we call it as a histone code or the information which is there hidden in these post-translational modifications can be interpreted and delineated in different biological perspectives. So as we know, there are a plethora of modifications which actually activate the gene transcription, whereas several others which repress the gene transcriptions. There are class of enzymes called writers which are actively involved in incorporating these marks onto the chromatin and activating transcription as is represented here, lysine for methylation. And this, uh, th there are several enzymes, methyl transferases, which are involved in this kind of modification, incorporation into chromatin. Again, there are a class of enzymes which are involved in putting in these repressive marks like H3K9 trimethylation, H3K27 trimethylation, et cetera. The class of enzymes known as writers are the enzymes which are incorporating these marks and the erasers basically remove these marks. So removal of these important modification can also have important functional consequence like the deacetylases remove the acetylation mark or demethylases remove the methylation mark. Our laboratory, on the other hand, is very much interested to study the function of chromatin readers, which docks onto these epigenetic modifications and interpret their functions. So chromatin readers can have diverse biological functions, and they can actually be ranging from architectural proteins like heterochromatin protein 1, which some of you might be aware of, binds to K9 methylation modification. It kind of coats the genome and represses or silences the chromatin. There could be chromatin remodelers with definitive function. Then there are chromatin modifiers, or the readers can also be adapters mediating several programs like transcription, repair, recombination, replication, etc. So let me give you an example how the chromatin readers actually work in a cellular condition. So this is a normal cell. Suppose I'm considering two different genomic loci. On the left hand side is a repressed genome loci where the repressive landscape is there. On the right hand side is an activated chromatin landscape. Now there is an environmental stimuli which actually activates several signal transduction pathways. And herein comes the role of the chromatin readers, which physically binds to these conserved epigenetic modifications and are instrumental in recruiting the writers and erasers differentially onto the chromatin. By so recruitment, there is change in the epigenetic landscape initiated, and there is change in the order of organization of the genome. And once the repressed genome can become decondensed, and the condensed part can again become, uh, and the decondensed part again can become condensed. So the gene expression fades change, and once repressed loci, which I was showing before I started on the left hand side, has now become active, and the active loci can become repressed. So this is how the chromatin readers can actually fine tune the programs and have the Im immense potential of programming the epigenomic landscape and changing the gene expression, gene expression states. So there are different modes of recognition that can be seen between the chromatin reader and its cognate epigenetic modifications. As you can see here, the A panel shows when the reader binds to the cognate modification on the same histone tails. In the B panel, you can see the reader's two domains of the same protein binds to two different modification on the same histone tails. This is when there are combinatorial readout in cis. There could be combinatorial readout in trans as well. That could be cl classified into two different types, intranucleosomal or internucleosomal. In the intranucleosomal recognition, where you find the two different histone tails harboring these modifications are bound by two different reader domains. Again, in the internucleosomal context, there could be two adjacent nucleosomes harboring these marks, and two different domains of the readers binds and recognizes them. Again, readers could be part of the multi subunit protein complexes where they can dock on in one site and another particular domain can dock onto a distal site in the nucleosomal context. So here I'm giving examples of some of the very common well-known reader domains with an example, like in the case of bromo domain, I'm giving here about CBP bromo domain. So 
any bromo domain has four helix bundle organization where the za and the bc loops as represented in the figure are the active sites harboring the critical residues which are involved in recognizing or binding to the acetylation mark so bromo domains are acetylation binding module so again another one this is a plant homeodomain finger phd finger an example is shown here is transcription factor 19 phd finger so phd fingers as such have a cysteine histidine organization as shown here in a cross press topology and in the active site there are different aromatic amino acids like tryptophan arginine valine etc so so apart from these tryptophan residues here shown are some of the other important uh, residues which are also involved in recognizing the cognate epigenetic mark so the phd finger as such is known in literature to recognize to hck4 trimethylation modification but there could be unmodified modification as well as acetylation mark being recognized by other page phd finger modules so there are different states that can be observed when these mod these modification recognizing domains occur in tandem as for example you can see here the bptf uh, uh, protein here there's a phd and bromo domain that are present on adjacent uh, positions and here the phd finger which is involved in binding to lysine 4 trimethylation mark whereas the bromo domain recognizes the h4k16 acetylation mark so they do their job in individual manner even in present in a uh, like juxtaposed position whereas take an example of the cbp bromo domain which has a plant homeo domain phd finger adjacent to this bromo domain here the role of the phd finger is more like a supportive function the bromo domain being involved in recognizing the acetylation mark this is the crystal structure of the cbp bromo phd module binding to k20 acetyl and you can see the phd finger has no exclusive binding partner here in this context so our laboratory research theme basically centers around understanding the role of these chromatin readers in recognizing their cognate modifications and how they can be implicated in different human diseases like tumorigenicity regulation host pathogen interaction metabolic response we are also trying to understand the intermediates example how host pathogen interaction can be implicated in a tumor model also the in the metabolic response that can be seen in a cancer cell backdrop so there the, as i uh, as i have been talking about the chromatin readers and their wide functional diversity our laboratory has two distinct aspects on which we are focusing one is to understand the conventional function of the chromatin reader family members and that we again do it in different biological contexts and in the second case we also focus on certain acquired acquired function of the chromatin readers that means to say these chromatin reader family members can have very different functions so the writers and the readers the initial introduction i explained about these two different domain different functions of these class of the proteins but of late there are reports and we have also observed that chromatin readers can have the acquired writer like functions like that means the reader domain the conventional function has been overcome by new functions so here again the histones could be the substrates where these chromatin readers work as for example we i'll talk about very briefly about ubr7 a protein with its phd finger which has now capability of ubiquitining ubiquitinating histone h to be lysine 120 again these readers can have non histone substrates like the chromobox protein cbx4 can sumoylate h dot which is another very interesting function that we have identified again another second class of the function of the, among the acquired function of chromatin readers is when the readers recognize instead of the histones other non histone substrates here also we are having some important candidates like transcription factor 19 protein and how it recognizes phosphorylated p53 and modulates their function so um, as uh, the family two proteins i would be introducing first as i was mentioning that acquired function here as you can see ubr7 protein it has the plant homeo domain in the center this phd finger as i introduced earlier is normally a histone h3 lysine 4 trimethyl binding 
module, but here we have observed that the PhD finger has acquired enzymatic catalytic activity and it can ubiquitinate histone H2B. As you see here, the wild type ubiquitinates and the catalytic mutant is unable to ubiquitinate. And we have extrapolated this function of ubiquitination in the cellular context and have correlated this that this particular ubiquitination mediated by UBR7 leads to suppression of cancer metastasis. Delineating the biological mechanism in greater details, we have identified our cadherin gene, which is a site where UBR7 mediated ubiquitination happens. And because of this ubiquitination, cancer metastasis is actually prevented. In absence of UBR7, this ubiquitination is actually highly downregulated, and this leads to activated cancer metastasis. We have recently observed uh, this function of UBR7 and reported in Nature Communications. So another important protein, as I was mentioning, is CBX4 protein, chromobox protein, which belongs to a chromodomain family. But we have observed, interestingly, that this protein can now sumoilate his H tert, which is, you know, telomerase, one of the important protein is tert protein. And in doing so, the sumoilation of H tert leads to it's increased recruitment onto e gene and suppression of e gene expression. As you know, e genes are very important uh, in suppressing the tumor in suppressing the tumorigenicity. So a repression of e can lead to ultimately invasive breast cancer formation with a programmed EMT, pro EMT being turned on. Whereas a catalytic mutant of CBX4, which cannot sumoilate H tert cannot lead to repression of e gene expression. And here, the EMT program is, is actually repressed. So this is, again, a very recent finding from our laboratory where we are showing that this kind of protein can actually modify other non-histone substrates. The third category, uh, we show that there is a recognition possible uh, by the chromatin readers onto other non-histone substrates. As you can see here, transcription factor 19, we have observed that it interacts with P53 protein. And this complex of TCF19 and P53 is very much involved in regulating the gene expression program in different stress situations. So we are focusing on glucose stress situations. And here we see that one of the key enzymes regulated by P53, which is the Tigger enzyme, and another enzyme, which is CO2, which is also a P53 responsive gene, are combinatorially regulated by both TCF19 and P53. And this uh, stress adaptation phenomenon is something very interesting in the chromatin reader function. Alongside to that, we also see the mitochondrial energy homeostasis is being regulated by this complex. And not only in the cellular context, this actually has important implication in the patient tumor models, which we are also investigating in the present context. So now I will take you through the conventional function of a chromatin reader family member. For today's talk, I'm highlighting on one of the protein chromatin readers, ZMYND8, with which we extensively work in the laboratory. So uh, as you all know, breast cancer is a currently a major threat detected in Indian women, and it causes huge uh, death in the population of the women folk. And the risk, the risk of this breast cancer is in a continuous rise in India. And it's estimated that in 1 in 28 women population is actually prone to breast cancer. So on the right hand side, you can see the different uh, cases of the cancer and how they're implicated in new death rate, new cases report, and new death, uh, death cases also reported is one of the highest in the female population in the breast cancer. So breast cancer can be of different subtypes. So one subtype is the hormone responsive breast cancer, which are ERPR positive breast cancer. The other one is the HER2 positive cancer. The third type of subtype of breast cancer is a triple negative breast cancer, which I will dis discuss in details. So, so in, the, in the Indian context, actually, and also in the world scenario, you can see on the right hand side that the cases of breast cancer is in a, is in a rise, continuous rise, with India is one of the leading causes of triple negative breast cancer. So uh, what is a triple negative best breast cancer? It is one of the most aggressive subtypes of breast cancer, which is negative, uh, found to be negative for ERPR or HER2 receptors. And this accounts for about 10 to 17 percent of the all reported breast cancer cases. It is very uh, aggressive form of breast cancer, and it is very 
uh, difficult to detect because all the important uh, markers are missing from this subtype of breast cancer. And so the majority cases can be detected after it crosses the grade three. Another important feature of this kind of breast cancer is early relapse, which is uh, after that surgical resection of these tumors, within two to three years time window, again, the breast cancers reappear. And this relapse of the breast cancer actually shortens the death of the patient. And uh, it's to be understood and it's kind of can be correlated that there is no suitable targeted therapy currently available for this triple negative breast cancer. Chemotherapy acts as the first line of the anti-cancer therapy as usual applicable for triple negative breast cancer. Idea being if we can shrink the TN, uh, TNBC size, then we can actually go for surgical removal of this breast cancer, uh, this uh, particular uh, cancer uh, masses but the problem here is again the chemotherapy is not the best suitable strategy for doing this kind of cancer treatments so as i was talking about zimind 8 protein you can see this is the domain organization of zimind 8 with a phd bromo pwwp domain and interspersed by zinc finger module in the n terminal part and recently in collaboration with dr roy's laboratory we have solved the extra crystal structure of this pbp domain and also we have done the structure of mint finger, which I'm not focusing for today's talk, but uh, this PPP domain uh, structure is known and it's cognate binding partners. We are trying to do co-crystal structures uh, of this PPP module. So uh, the first report of Zimind 8 came from our laboratory in 2016, where we first did a unbiased peptide array scan. And you can see on the left-hand side, this is the typical peptide array scan. And uh, from here, we observe that it is a binder to K36 dimethylation and H4K16 acetylation. So peptide array showed ditri binding, but when we looked into the cellular context, we identified that dimethylation is a better binder as compared to the trimethylation mark. So these are the immunofluorescence studies, which was done with Zimind 8, co-localizing with 36 dimethylation mark, but when you have the PPP domain, which is the chromatin binding module deleted, we do not see the co-localization happening here. Similarly, with the 16AC also, co-localization was best seen when the full length protein was there. And upon deletion of the PPP module, this co-localization was severely compromised. So we went ahead and did cell biological immunoprecipitation studies. And you can see here the wild type protein was able to interact with 36 dimethylation as well as 16 acetylation mark. But deletion of the PBP domain led to no interaction possible between these two modifications, indicating that this particular PBP domain is crucial for recognizing, recognizing its cognate interacting partner, which is the modified histones. However, deletion of the PBP domain could still have interactions with HDAC1 or CHD4, which are component of NERD chromatin remodeling complex with which ZMY ND8 interacts. We established direct one-on-one -on -one interaction subsequently by doing, again, peptide pull-down assays where we observed that PBP domain binds to both these 36 dimethylation. And interestingly, this was found to be binding to the H3.1, that is a canonical histone, but it did not bind to the variant histones. And K16 acetylation also was it's equally uh, recognized by the PBP domain, but not with the mean domain here. So this is the paper that we published uh, regarding this, where we showed that the dual recognition module, that is the uh, D8 harbors uh, the, both the chromatin binding domains with which it recognizes the 36 dimethylation and 16 acetylation mark, and also is instrumental in regulating all trans retinoic acid responsive gene expression. I will come to this shortly. So, this is this the PBP domain harboring protein Zimind 8. We then subsequently went ahead and wanted to do gene expression analysis. And through microarray analysis, we observed that there were several cancer pathways that were affected upon silencing ZMY and D8. So we ultimately identified that D8 is actually an important tumor suppressor protein and as a regulatory VMT. Importantly, in this particular paper, we show that the epithelial gene expression program was positively regulated by Zimind 8. So we went ahead into the mouse tumor models, and you can see here that these are the 41 induced tumors generated in mice, where the tumor sizes 
uh, was appreciable and upon over expressing this d8 in the same 41 uh, cells we find there's a the tumor regression was observed we quantified these in multiple mice experiments so so this dual histone reader function of zmint is ultimately instrumental in programming the epithelial genes and is acting as a tumor suppressor in this context so as i was mentioning upon doing the microanalysis and uh, we observed that there was a sub subsequent overlap with re responsive gene network so this is uh, th there was there were substantial number of up regulated as well as down regulated gene when we compare d8 regulated gene with a atro responsive gene subset so this is the biological analysis network and the candidate hubs were subsequently uh, verified by doing the re real time pcr analysis so what is atra this is the structure of all trans retinoic acid atra it is uh, very commonly used in uh, the glioblastoma treatments as well as in case of the leukemia models you might be you might have heard about the leukemia model treatment of atra but recently there are certain reports that are coming up that atra treatment is also very important in case of triple negative breast cancer and we observe that atra treatment can actually program the human epigenome with alteration of the epigenomic landscape and you can see here 36 dimethylation mark getting induced upon atra treatment whereas 16 acetylation similarly induced whereas the 36 tri or 36 monomethylation marks were found to be down regulated not only in this uh, global manner in the local specific manner we observed that in certain genes 36 dimethylation and 16 acetylation modification which are the cognate modifications which are recognized by zmyn d8 were enriched enriched uh, upon atra treatment so these are the cog cognate genes like tuj1 tau drd2 nav1.2 snap25 all these genes showed higher amounts of these 36 dimethylation and 16 acetylation levels so the atra treatment can actually uh, cause several changes in the cancer cells in this particular study we focused on the changes that it can lead to d8 promoter we observed that several epigenetic signatures were altered leading to altered expression of d8 and d8 mediated anti proliferative activity was actually triggered upon atra treatment interestingly we also observed in heterotumor, heterotopic tumor models that this treatment of atra or injection of atra to the mouse tumors and then we dissected those tumors and uh, did immunohistochemistry for d8 we observed that there is an upregulation of d8 which is can be related to tumor regression so atra actually modulates several other transcription factors not only d8 but d8 is definitely one of the key targets of atra and atra mediated regression of tumor models is very well established now and the first report actually came from our laboratory so these are listed some of the most common drugs which are used in the breast cancer chemotherapy anthracycline family members like doxorubicin epirubicin taxin members like paclitaxel rosetaxel 5 fluorouracil cyclophosphamide carboplatin all these drugs are very conventional chemotherapeutic drugs used for the breast cancer treatment however it is slowly becoming very obvious that this chemotherapy is not a very promising promising therapy for the triple negative breast cancer context and there is a need for new therapeutic strategies i'll give you some examples where studies have al already reported that treatment with anthracycline drugs like doxorubicin can elicit an initial response or chemosensitivity to tnbcs but this is very short duration spell and following this uh, there is a metastatic relapse and there is higher rate of tumor tnbc tumors coming up and the response is much higher as compared to non tnbc breast tumors again there is another important thing that initial susceptibility of the chemotherapy towards the tnbc tumors has been shown to ultimately leading to a, a lack of the complete response and there is the again uh, the tumors come up again and so there's this particular thing as i was telling the recurrent tumor actually leads to a further shortening of the life cycle of lifespan of the patients so even after chemotherapy even after chemotherapy treatment the risk of the relapse in the first 3 to 5 years have been found to be significantly high so all these definitely point out that there is a need 
of alternative targeted therapies for triple negative breast cancer. Along this, I would like to point out another very important thing, which is drug resistance that is seen in the case of the breast cancer context. So I've drawn here some simple cartoons. As you can see, this is a tumor cell. When you target these cells to a chemotherapy, it can have chemosensitive cells, which subsequently undergoes apoptosis, cell killing. But there is selection of a particular class of cells, which are known as chemoresistant cells. So this drug resistant population of cells can have different mechanisms because of which this resistance phenotype actually happens. And incurring of this resistance leads to actually promotion of EMT and cancer stem cell like phenotypes. So these are the highlighted mechanisms why the drug resistance can happen. First, well-studied mechanism is increased drug efflux. So you know that our cells have ABC transporters or these efflux pumps, which are instrumental in flushing out the drugs from inside the cell. So there is increased activity of these drug efflux pumps that can be seen in these resistant tumor models. The second mechanism is decreased drug uptake. So there are several other factors which leads to reduction in the uptake of these drugs. Altered the drug metabolic rates, there are several detoxifying enzymes as shown here. This leads to alteration in the drug metabolism means that drugs basically get actually chewed up and it's no longer functioning effic efficaciously. The another alternative mechanism that is seen is enhanced DNA damage response, uh, DNA damage repair response pathways. This leads to activation of ATM DNA PKs and this leads to uh, again alteration in the resistance properties. Then uh, there is the inhibition of apoptosis by the class uh, important hallmark genes like bcl 2 bax expression changes. And the very recent findings show that the ECM, that is the matrix, the extracellular matrix, there are certain factors like type 1 collagen, fibronectin, etc., that expression is enhanced. This leads to strengthening of the ECM matrix, which could also be a cause for the enhanced drug resistance in cancer. So in our case, we have a drug resistant model, which we use very uh, judiciously in the laboratory. You can see here, these are the chemo sensitive cells. When these cells are treated to a sub lethal dose of these important chemotherapeutic drugs like doxorubicin, 5-fluorouracil, you will start seeing a selection of chemo resistant cells in this population. So this resistant cell population actually slowly increases. So these chemotherapeutic drugs in a sub lethal dose, what it does, as we have observed, is these, as I, as I was talking about this, drug efflux pumps, ABCB1, ABCC1, or ABCC2, etc. These expression of these efflux pumps, you can see there's an increase upon doxorubicin or 5-fluorouracil treatment. Not only the expression of these efflux pumps, the EMT genes as well as cancer stem cell markers, all of these show an increase in case of a sublethal dose of chemotherapeutic drugs. So this is something that uh, that is very contrasting to well, uh, well understood phenomenon, but this is not only our laboratory, several other groups have also found similar situations, seen that a sublethal dose is actually, instead of killing the cells, is uh, having alternative pathways activated, turned on, and can program the cancer cell very differently. So you can see here again, this low dose of doxorubicin can induce the sphere formation ability, as well as you can also see that the conventional CD44 positive, 24 negative, that is the CSE marker cells actually are found to be increased in a low dox treated condition. So CSE content actually goes up upon low dox treatment. So this clearly indicates that lowering down this doxorubicin treatment. Now you can always ask the question, what was the need of cutting down the dox doses? This is basically, you know, that doxorubicin chemotherapeutic drug has treated in a very high dose is very devastating to the cells. Not only there's a huge cell killing, but there is also several off-target effects. So it has been continuous endeavor from the clinical perspective to reduce the dosage of these drugs, turning the system more efficacious in some other alternative manner. So we proposed that there are several other targeted therapies that can be combined along with this low dose of chemotherapeutic drug, which is very efficacious to kill these cancer cells. So shown here are some of the conventional targeted therapies. We focus on the epitherapy or epigenetic therapy. 
And as you know, the epigenetic enzyme mediated targeted uh, cell killing is already there. But in our study, we have proposed that epigenetic readers could be used as a new target for triple negative breast cancer. So what we have observed that although low dose of doxorubicin actually triggers the expression of z 8 as you can see, it is actually more in amount, but we then subsequently did a nuclear cytosolic fractionation, and we observed that substantial portion of this protein actually translocates to cytosol. So it's no longer a functional component in the nucleus, regulating the transcription program as it is supposed to do. Situations can, however, be uh, kind of uh, rescued by overexpressioning ZMY ND8, where again the nuclear amounts can be restored. So the DOCS actually, although it leads to higher amount of D8, but when we looked at the cognate gene loci where the D8 is normally recruited, we observed that D8 is actually removed from these loci. For example, in the CD44 genes, ZMY ND8 actually is removed upon DOCS treatment. So we, we show that low dose, although it induces D8 expression, a part of it shows cytoplasmic translocation. And whatever residual amount is there in the nucleus actually shows removal and it, uh, it's, it's removal from chromatin or it's no longer as tightly bound to chromatin as it is supposed to remain. Then we went ahead and looked at the situation where we concomitantly overexpress ZMY and D8 in a low dox treated situation. So here are the four situations, control, dox treated, ZMY and D8 overexpressed and ZMY and D8 along with dox treatment seen. And with these four conditions, we did several experiments. The first panel, as you can see here, is the percentage of cells which were CD44 positive, 24 negative, to show you the CSC content. And so you can see here, while the DOX treatment was initially engaged in increasing the CSC percentage of the cells, but upon D8 overexpression, it, uh, in com combination with DOX treatment, it was again reduced. Alongside with this, the sphere formation assays, you can see here very clearly that uh, the D8 overexpression in combination with DOCS treatment was instrumental in reducing the percentage sphere formation ability. We also looked at these cell migration functions, and you can see here the DOCS treatment, which had led to increased cellular migration, and the combination of D8 plus DOCS actually leads to a reduced cell migration function. So D8 actually chemosensitizes these cancer cells, and to, uh, to drug treatment and reduces the tumorigenic potential in vitro and, the, in, and also the, the breast cancer stem cell population. Okay, so uh, we finally went ahead into the mice models. Shown here is the 41 induced mice models, but we also did tuned mice models in our study. So here, as you can see here, the uh, top panel, this is the doxorubicin treated uh, these tumors. And here, D8 was overexpressed, and along with this, doxorubicin was treated. So definitely, there was more regression of the tumors that could be seen. And the CSC percentages, as was seen here, CD44 positive, 24 positive in the murine models, showed a reduction uh, from these tumors uh, when we looked at the content. And again, we also looked at the expression of these ABC, ABC, C, C, ABCB1 or the drug resistance genes, the EMT genes, and the uh, uh, CAC genes, and all these genes showed uh, the increased amount of their expression that was there triggered upon DOCS treatment was actually down-regulated upon overexpressing this ZMY and D8 protein. So the combination is actually very, very efficacious in repressing the expression of these bad genes, so-called, in the cells. And so the effect of chemotherapy uh, which was seen at a low dose, that is the, the turning on of the bad genes that actually can be uh, restored back or the repressed here in this particular case, leading to a tumor suppression mechanism. So D8 chemo sensitizes the tumors to drug treatment and reduces the tumorigenic potential and the breast cancer stem cell content in vivo. So now I would like to take you through a very interesting aspect so in this, in, if you look at the cancer cell, how it, the programs occur in the cancer cell versus the typical developmental programs, or the embryonic developmental program of the trophoblast from the trophoblast, you will see a similarity or parity between the two. So you can see here from the normal cell to malignant cell, 
the EMT programs need to be turned on. Similar partial EMT can be seen when the cytotrophoblast turns on to extravillous uh, extra trophoblasts. Then there are invasion markers like MMP expression, cell adhesion markers, cytokine production. All these show changes in the cancer context. Similarly, it can also be seen in the trophoblastic developmental stages. Finally, the immunosuppression mechanism that is also a very typical thing that can be seen. So this uh, immunosuppression mechanism, angiogenesis mechanism, all have parallelism or similarity in the case of trophoblastic model as well. So since uh, we are studying the uh, the cancers, and the, it's it's well known that in the case of the embryonic developmental stage, the epigenetic pattern plays crucial role. We just hypothesized whether there could be a parities between these two very different scenarios. So in the trophoblastic developmental stage, we know that the poised epigenetic program or bivalent epigenetic program is very important. And there are several genes which are maintained in poised state during the embryonic development. So we hypothesized or we wanted to ask the question whether in cancer cells, similar poised programs actually physically exist. So I'm giving you one very key example that has come up from uh, one uh, the very important uh, hallmark laboratory. So here they have shown that in a Z1 promoter, which is maintained in a poised epigenetic state in the basal-like breast cancer, in the luminal cells, in the Z1 expression is mostly repressed because the repressive mark K27 trimethylation is turned on. Whereas this basal type, you see both K4ME3 and K27ME3. As you understand, K4ME3 is a transcription activation modification, and 27ME3 is a repression modification. So in the ZEB1, it shows this poised epigenetic landscape. And when, in the case of the basal uh, type of tumors with high CD44 expression, or which is becoming more kind of invasive in nature, this uh, poised landscape turns on towards more activated state. So these, uh, this was studied very well in the case of a ZEV1 promoter. And it was shown that this poised hypothesis is actually there. And uh, so we actually wanted to check in our tumorigenicity model whether the programs can be uh, like the stem cells. So um, I would like to draw your attention and uh, to a very simple example. So you can see here how we can relate to bivalent or poised genes. This is just like a ship which is anchored in a dock. So it has a positive mark that is a lysine for methylation, but the anchorage mark 27 ME3, so the ship cannot move. So the restoration of the silencing is maintained when this K4 ME3 mark is removed and 27 ME3 mark is there retained. And activated state, there is a removal of this 27 ME3 mark and only K4 ME3 mark is when this transcription program again starts. That means our ship, leaves the dock and moves. So this is the poised epigenetic state with a well-balanced K4K27ME3 modification. And so, so as we see that the treatment with these chemotherapeutic drug at a lower dose is actually leading to transcription on programs. So we wanted to ask whether combination is actually instrumental in programming this poised epigenetic landscape towards this repression being restored. So as I was mentioning that we see that combination of these two things, that is the treatment of this chemotherapeutic drug along with this overexpression of this critical chromatin reader ZMYNDA was instrumental in restoration of the anti-tumorigenic potential in the cells of the tumor cell repression mechanism. We, was, we, we now try to zoom into the mechanism of that and how the poised sta state of the epigenetic program could have some important role. Interestingly, we observed that the cancer stem cell genes, like similarly the EMT-MDR genes, were found to have higher expression of the K4-ME3 mark and a reduced expression of K27-ME3 mark upon doxorubicin treatment, as you can see here. So this means to say these bad genes, that is EMT genes, MDR genes, CSC genes, all are getting turned on upon doxorubicin treatment because the balance is now tilted towards more transcription activating signatures, K4 ME3 marks, and abrogation of 27 ME3 modification from the promoting landscape. So poise promoters are getting activated upon low, low drug treatment. And now what is happening is 
can we restore the situation upon the overexpression of the ZMY in D8? And the answer is yes. You can see the alteration in the K4M3 landscape tremendously. The heightened expression of K4M3 is now tremendously repressed. And the repressed landscape of K27M3 is now turned on or activated, as you can see here. So this indicates that overexpression of D8 is instrumental in, again, repressing the bad gene expression, like CD44 is repressed by establishing the 27ME3 mark onto these genes and removal of K4ME3 mark onto these genes. Now, how does this happen? So D8 overexpression followed by drug treatment actually removes lysin 4 methylation and promotes 27ME3 recruitment. So the key enzymes that are involved in K4ME3 and K27ME3 regulation are these two important methyl transferase and demethylase. For K27ME3, you know, EZH2, which is part of ERC2 complex, is well known, which is a methyl transferase for lysine 27 trimethylation. Similarly, for K4ME3 removal, KDM5C is a very important enzyme which is involved in removal of the K4ME3 is an important demethylase. So here we observed that along with the removal of K4ME3, the mechanism we hunted and we saw that there is increased recruitment of K KDM5C upon D8 overexpression and combination with DOCS treatment. Along with that, there was also increased recruitment of EZH2, which is leading to increased K27ME3 landscape in the chromatin context. So I'm giving you all one examples, but we observed this in all the EMT, MDR, CSC genes, indicating this is a generalized mechanism, how it is happening. But now the question remains, that is the recruitment of these enzymes, key enzymes of K4, uh, ME3 demethylase, that is KDM5C and K27 trimethylation enzyme EZH2, whether it is dependent on ZMY and D8. And we, uh, for, before we went into that, we observed that ZMY and D8 can actually form complexes with these two enzymes, KDM5C and EZH2, through immunoprecipitation assays, as well as through sucrose density gradient centrifugation. You can see here distinct peaks where these, these ternary complexes formed, and we are trying to understand the why these two complexes, complex shifted peaks are very different. Actually, they have very different functions. We're investigating that in more greater details. But what we have observed that KDM5C has been previously reported to be an interactor of ZMY and D8. And this interaction is very strong or stringent interaction as it is even retained in presence of DNS1 enzyme digestion. But EZH2 association with D8 actually is very chromatin landscape specific. When we do the ZMY and D8 EZH2 interaction in presence of DNS1, the interaction is drastically diminished indicating these two complexes actually assemble onto the chromatin landscape. So the associations between these proteins are of very different nature. And uh, so when we silenced ZMY ND8, we did not observe significant differences in the expression of KDM5C or EZH2 and the concomitant epigenetic mark, which these two enzymes modify. But what we saw very drastically is the recruitment model that in absence of D8, the recruitment of KDM5C into its distinct lo loci, that is a CD44 loci, as well as the recruitment of EZH2 onto the similar loci was highly compromised. This indicated that D8 is basically the vehicle which is carrying these two cargos, these two writer enzymes, KDM5C and EZH2 to its cognate loci. So D8 is the main factor behind regulating this poised epigenetic landscape of these tumor promoting genes in our studies. So this is the overall, uh, I, overall the summary of the study that you can see here. This is the untreated cells where you can see the EMT genes, MDR genes, Temnes genes all get highly turned on because this uh, ZMY ND8 EZH2 KDM5C complex has moderate recruitment and uh, this uh, basically turns on these genes. But treatment of this chemotherapeutic dr drugs actually causes a havoc in the system when these genes are getting highly, highly turned on, this co-complex getting recruited. Uh, but uh, what you can see here, this co-complex recruitment is compromised because ZMY and D8 is no longer getting into chromatin to that extent as we have seen, although D8 is induced, but its recruitment to its cognate sites in the genome is highly reduced. 
So its other interacting partners also cannot get into chromatin. And so these programs are highly turned on. Whereas a combination therapy where we, along with this chemotherapeutic drug, put this particular ZM binding D8 in higher amounts or overexpress them in the system, we find that EMT, MDR, stemless genes are again rest, uh, re repressed to significant extent. So this indicates clearly that this epitherapy in this particular case, in alongside with this chemotherapy, is one of the best uh, techniques here that we can exploit and have fundamental uh, application in the cancer models. So since the uh, structure of ZMY indeed PBP domains is now known, we can think of designing PBP mimics and other small molecule uh, or artificial transcription factors, which will be instrumental in taking these important epigenetic enzymes more and more to these tumor suppressing genes and uh, so that these gene expression programs are repressed. The uh, I, Again, I'm reiterating why ZMY and D8 in combination with this is one of the best strategies is because D8 is a chromatin reader and it can take these enzymes to its cognate sites and along with this, these readers have a degree of specificity which in, in terms of site selection can be attained. So if you modify these big enzymes like methyltransferase or demethylase, there could be pleiotropic effects. But if you really target these small uh, chromatin readers which have gene specific functions, your function can be actually well perceived in, as you can see here, combination therapy is physically repressing these bad genes leading to uh, anti-cancer situations. So uh, at the end, I would like to acknowledge my team here. There's a fantastic group of people. Uh, so many of them have uh, actually completed PhD. So this is uh, like two years back, but I have kept some of these rare gems from my lab who have really contributed a lot in the lab foundation and uh, doing some potential new direction studies. But we have several new comers in the laboratory now, and they all are involved in great understanding of this chromatin reader field. And so I would also like to acknowledge my funding agencies. Without the financial stuff, this kind of high-end research work is not possible. And also my collaborators for making this work possible. And thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for that wonderful talk. So our uh, chat box is now full of interesting questions. Should we go ahead with the questions, ma'am? Yeah, sure. Um, Okay. So will you tell me the questions um, or should I see it from some place? Yes, ma'am. I'll tell you the questions. I'll tell you the questions. I'll read it out. So this uh, is a question from uh, Prabhat Kumar Shwain. And uh, he's asking whether triple negative breast cancer, how it happens and how uh, is it cured and can it be cured through chromatin readers? Okay, so as I was introducing about the breast cancer and triple negative breast cancer is a subtype of uh, this breast cancer, which is ERPR HER2 negative. So uh, this uh, happens because of certain mutations in the genome or there are could be other epigenetic aberrations that leads to this selection of this type of particular breast cancer. But the challenge here is its detection is really difficult because the prognostic markers are not there. And so that's what I was mentioning, that uh, once it is there on grade 3, grade 4 stage attains before you actually designate that, that tumor has actually happened. And so as I was mentioning that employing the chromatin reader along with this uh, chemotherapeutic regimen is one of the approaches that we are thinking for long term perspective as well. But you can understand we cannot overexpress a chromatin reader in the cells like that. That's why we have the structure with us now, and we imagine that we can have a small mimic or a generated artificial transcription factor, which can be instrumental in targeting this TNBC cells. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Shanshari Gorai wants to know, uh, how can triple negative breast cancer be identified? Very good question. So as you understand that the conventional markers are not there. So new markers are actually coming up 
there are lots of new markers which are there for TNBCs, and definitely we have high promise for this epigenetic markers. So for our study, I, you can see that using ZMint as one of the uh, good uh, expression systems, you can see that in the TNBC context also there is an increased expression of the ZMint 8. So although it functions very differently, but uh, so that can also be used for a, a kind of quick diagnosis. So ZMint 8 is one example I'm giving, but there, there are several other epigenetic enzymes which are now used for detection because it, they, it's an absence of the common the markers that are normally used. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the ne next question is from Shrota Mahendra, and she's asking what role does long non-coding RNA play in breast cancer, and can they act as prognostic markers for breast cancer? Hi, Shrota. Nice question. So, actually, long non-coding RNAs definitely is one of the epigenetic regulatory mechanisms that are involved in breast cancer and our studies are also we are we have an ongoing study where we find that uh, one of our fam favorite chromatin reader proteins are involved in regulating this long non-coding rna population and that also has important implication so uh, these are different mediators and definitely long non-coding rna holds a lot of promise and that also we we are pursuing these studies for, from our laboratory thank you ma'am uh, our next question is from Shondi Pramanik, and he wants to know uh, how does ATRA treatment react with cancer cells? So all transretinoic acid is a well-known chemotherapeutic drug. So uh, what we have observed, it's, it's what is known earlier that is an anti-proliferative kind of function of ATRA that in several cancers, if ATRA is treated, like it's very well worked out in the leukemia model as well as in the terminal breast, the terminal brain cancer models, GBM models, that ATRA can actually repress the cell proliferation levels in those by fine-tuning expression of certain genes. So now, uh, so we also observe that uh, this is true even for the breast cancer models as well as in the neuronal cancer models that ATRA can program these cancer cells epigenetically. Right. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, our next question is from Shubhash Tanti Roy, and he wants to know that uh, the chromatin reader, if it's effectively working in suppression of uh, other cancers, or is it working exclusively for breast cancer? And if so, why? Okay, so uh, there are different types of chromatin readers. And some of the chromatin readers can also have anti-tumorigenic function in multiple cancer models. Like Zimin 8 actually we see is a generalized tumor suppressor in function. So not only in breast cancer, breast cancer system is what we are delving in great details, but there are other cancers also where Zimin 8 has tumor suppression function. So the mechanisms could be very different from one cancer to another. And that depends on the molecular details of the understanding of it. But it is possible, but we have to bear in mind that application or how it can be used for the cancer context is a little bit ahead of time. Even we are now understanding the molecular events in greater details, and that gives us impetus to design small molecules and other stuff to target the cancer biologically in different, uh, modulating different programs. Right. Our uh, next question is from Umarani Dash. Uh, she wants to know what is a grade three tumor? Okay, so uh, any cancer will have different grades depending upon its uh, kind of uh, the severity, I would say, the grade one, grade two, grade three. As the grades increase, the tumor, tumorigenicity of those uh, particular cases are on a higher end. So, so there are different markers for grade, grade, I would say grade um, authentication, like this is grade one tumor or expression of certain other biomarkers makes it grade two tumor, grade three tumor like that. So uh, there are different tumors that can be biologically classified depending upon how, how potential the tumor threat is accordingly the classifications are made. Thank you, ma'am. 
Uh, our next question is from Shonak Shahu. Uh, he's also part of the PPB team. He wants to know that, uh, do you envision the combination therapy will be applicable to any particular type of breast cancer? And what is the rationale uh, to use MB231 cells over uh, TNBC cell line in uh, the experiments? Oh, actually, uh, the TNBC cell line models, if you study, this in the cell lines, MDMB231, MDMB468 are the cells. Uh, I actually wanted to say that we use TNBC cell lines for our studies. And also we extrapolate our studies to the animal models as we do the syngenic model as well as the nude mice models to understand the questions in a greater details. But uh, combination therapy, as I was again uh, telling, is it's definitely a possibility with these important chromatin reader proteins. But uh, as you understand very well, the overexpression like, like that is not a feasible option in the patient in the patient cases. So in that particular context, we would have to think about a mimic or a small molecule of uh, which will resemble or which will have functions analogous to D8 in the cells where it can be used. But uh, I want to state that it is not only breast cancer. There are different other cancers. The molecular mechanisms are, however, different in them. So targeting D8 is could be a very good strategy in the different uh, different cancer contexts. Right. We have a second question from Shonchari Gorai. She wants to know if personalized medicine can be useful for treating triple negative breast cancer. Okay. So a good uh, question, and the study that I just uh, covered uh, has been reported in cell death diseases. So in this particular study, uh, so you will see that we have done a lot of patient sample analysis. So in this patient sample uh, analysis, analysis window, we observed that uh, this z 8 expression is actually very different in different patient cohorts. And alongside with it, these uh, programs are also very different. So definitely, depending upon the D8 expression levels, we can think that there could be a subset of uh, this population which are D8 high that could be more uh, that could have uh, more response in TNBC cases as compared to a population which is D8 low. So I mean to say the D8 low cases, the cancer potential is more higher, whereas the D8 high cases that anti tumorigenic functions are more prominent. So accordingly, the patients can be subgrouped into different cohorts. And there, this this personalized questions can actually be addressed in this context. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, the next question is from Sitaram Maharana, and uh, he wants to know whether there is a molecular therapy like miRNA or pan RNA for treatment of breast cancer. Yeah, it is definitely a very promising uh, therapeutic target, but. See, there are uh, different ways of looking at these things, things that happen in the cellular context. And we are at present gathering more and more information, trying to understand things. But in eventually in the patient therapeutic context, these miRNA or non-coding RNAs can have definite roles. But in getting into the therapeutic regimen and platform, it is still, it will take time. And uh, it, because we have to understand a lot of intermediate stages, but they are definitely these non-coding RNAs have good promises as a good therapeutic option. Uh, my next question is from Krishna Shahu. Uh, wants to know what is the cause of fibrosarcoma? Okay, so uh, like any other cancers, this fibrosarcoma also could be initiated because of several molecular events. In general, if you kind of uh, make it simple, cancer definitely has a lot of issues that are there with the gene mutations or genetic mutations, as well as there are several other epigenetic reasons like DNA methylation alteration or histone PTMs change are also, and then there are also non-coding RNA mediated uh, strategies that go alter, altered. And so this, like any other cancer, you can also envision all these different heterogeneous things that can be actual cause for uh, this particular type of cancer. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, a second question from Sitara Maharana. Um, he wants to know whether the epigenetic markers are inherited or not. 
so actually you know right definition of epigenetics is uh, telling that the, the, like unlike the genes which are inherited epigenetic information is not uh, like like that inherited in as such like that but so if you look at the histones as such the histone pools it's it's very different from the dna mediated semi conservative replication where the parental and the newly formed dna part of the information is actually semi conserved but the histones it's uh, there are different schools of thought some say that a part of the newly synthesized histones get into this uh, new newly synthesized dna strands but there is it's not uh, like a 50% 50% segregation there will be mix and match of these histones these histones are important because these are the landmarks bearing this post translation modifications so things will be very different uh, so it's not typically like a semi conservative mechanism of the dna what you can uh, think about in here right uh, ma'am uh, so uh, these are our questions and uh, okay we have one more uh, so this is a question from uh, vishwadeep ghosh she wants to know whether zymnd8 act as an anti uh, does it have an anti metastatic role in cancer yeah we have we have already observed that anti proliferative anti metastatic role so anti metastatic role is in a very different fashion so we have seen that it on one hand uh, does positive regulation of epithelial genes on the other hand the uh, the the mesenchymal genes are actually repressed so uh, examples of some of these emt and dr csc genes and the mechanism how it is repressed by d8 is what i spoke about now so definitely d8 has anti metastatic role in the context of cancer right uh ma'am uh, i uh, i would like to ask you something like uh, so uh, a lot of uh, different kinds of approaches are there like to fight cancer right now like there's immunotherapy and uh, there is the epigenetic approach and we used to listen uh, we used to hear something uh, when we were in college cancer has no answer where do you think this answer is going to come from like which of these uh, combinations or which of these fields which one are you most hopeful about so um as you said that uh, there is a very very uh, diverse thing regarding the cancer is whatever you try to target there are there are anti mechanisms that the cancer cells select and build so you have all the things there will be uh, there, there are other mechanism by, bypass mechanism so targeting cancer is really a very difficult task but uh, we have lot of hope with this epigenetic therapy i would say it's not only because we are working but the epigenetic reader field is something which deserves special mention so as i was mentioning about other epigenetic enzymes which are giant molecules and you do any manipulation to the genome with these epigenetic uh, readers or writer readers uh, writers or erasers you will have pleiotropic effect because it's not affecting one gene it is affecting a plethora of genes but targeting the readers is a very unique strategy because there is a gene specific alterations readers are also are not uh, something uh, will take things to a particular genomic landscape only so suppose that bromodome binds to acetylation mark but all the genes which have has acetylated histones will not be targeted by a particular part of the chromatin reader only certain subsets will be targeted that way targeting this uh, chromatin landscape by the chromatin readers is definitely a potential so you guys all know about crispr cas9 strategy right so uh, the modified crispr cas9 strategy is actually bestowing on the fact that instead of gene deletion people are using cas9 mutants and they are they are conjugating to uh, these different types of reader domains which takes this entire complex to different chromatin loci so we envision that these chromatin readers can thereby be in combination with this crispr cas9 system might have a very good efficacy in programming this epigenetic uh, landscapes and have important clinical outcomes so epigenetic therapy definitely has lot in store so as time progresses newer and newer information will come out and we'll really see the lot of things that we anticipate today might come true tomorrow so uh, on that hopeful note 
we uh, th thank you so much for being here with us today. It was a wonderful talk, and uh, oh, we really enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to uh, I would like to thank uh, Rupatha and all the other members uh, for uh, kind of getting me excited to give this uh, talk on a Sunday evening, and I'm really kind of amazed to see that so many questions. That means people at least are trying to hear part of the things that we are talking about in this uh, particular webinar. So I uh, thank you guys very much for uh, making uh, my talk here and share my kind of research dreams along with this uh, lot of new people here and i would look forward to more such interactions in future thank you ma'am and uh, i i think uh, this is going to inspire so many people to uh, get into research of this kind thank you so much and um, thank you all for watching us thank you for all of you who are supporting us on social media Please keep supporting us. Follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and follow um, our YouTube channel. Next week, we are going to have two um, webinars, two talks, and I hope uh, you're going to join us as uh, and make that a great success as well. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you.